hi. <clears throat> Who else has been playing Pokemon Go recently? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I'll get started if everyone's ready to listen. Um, thanks for coming to my talk today, and special thanks to all the organizers and crew at ShakaCon. Really appreciate being able to talk in such a beautiful place. Um, I promised myself I'd get out more when I was in Hawaii, but so far my trip has been playing VR games and playing Pokemon Go. I mean, Pokemon Go is outside still, so it still counts. But <laughs> okay, so to my talk, um, my talk for today, The Nihilist Guide to Wrecking Humans and Systems, we're going off, uh, we'll be going over some fun attack training by combining social engineering and attack, uh, sorry, um, combining social engineering and technical attacks, and it will be also looking at the problems on focusing on technical attacks and social engineering as separate risks. I'll also be telling some personal war stories about how security went very wrong. Okay, but before I start, some of you are probably wondering about who I am. Um, I'm Christina, I'm from Australia, currently in Chicago, and I do mostly pen testing and social engineering. Um, I really like cats and whiskey. I usually do this talk with my coworker Shubs, um, and we go back and forth with the stories that we tell. However, it will just be me today that you need to put up with. Uh, Shubs likes absinthe. Okay, let's get our hands dirty. First, let's talk about humans and computers. When I think about computers, I usually go, what are you? And sorry, when I think about humans, not computers, and the human usually says, I'm a strong, independent being, and I have feelings, I have emotions, I can talk to people, and I can relate to people, and I have wants and needs that require interactions, and I like stuff and things, and I like to feel like I have control over computers. But when we ask the same question to computers, um, sorry, basically a human is someone that is capable of making judgment calls. And when we ask the same question to computers, uh, the computer says, I can follow instructions good, and I, it has no emotion, and it is not capable of making judgment calls. Uh, so it's just a bunch of binary. And when we think about them together from a risk standpoint, we're at a stage in InfoSec where we're doing a pretty okay job at assessing the vulnerabilities in each. Computers are scanned and they're penetration tested and they're audited and they're reviewed and they're secured. And similarly with humans, they're trained, audited, monitored, and disciplined. And while that may all sound okay, we're forgetting about one simple but important, but important fact. We're putting something that can make judgment calls, something that is capable of feeling emotions in front of a machine that is only capable of following instructions and has no emotion. So when human and computer come together, we realize that we can coerce humans in front of these machines to do things for us. Instructions are given out by people and all a computer knows um, is to follow these instructions that we give it. Effectively, this means that we can make other people's computers or other people's machines do things that we, the attackers, want because there is a person in front of that computer. And while that, in a creative sense, is an amazing achievement in the world and has led uh, and has resulted in bounds of amazing achievements and blah, 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 um, in security, it's a fundamental flaw. We're putting emotion in front of an emotionless system that is responsible for securing your data. So now that we have that out of the way, um, what exactly is the problem here? The problem is that we're focusing on these risks separately, wherein we're assessing human and technical risks, risks separately, where we should be assessing them as a collective issue. And we're giving humans access to break the rules that we set on computers in the first place. Okay. Okay, with that, let me now tell you a story about a recent engagement that I worked on. Through the talk, I'll be going through some real-world uh, real war stories with real screenshots, and we'll explore what went wrong from a technical and social standpoint. 
So with this company, um, I had started with an email. The email was targeted to be sent to a large sample size of employees, and I was impersonating their healthcare benefits team, something that most of us in the audience probably care about. And when I thought about um, how to make this scenario, I thought about how a specially crafted bad email could result in a much more sophisticated attack chain. I, so I started by spoofing an email from their healthcare benefits team, and the email said in short, hi, due to a recent change in our healthcare benefits provider, it's time for you to update your details. Please log into the portal in the URL you can find below. Now, this scenario worked particularly well because the company was actually going through a healthcare benefits uh, provider change at the time, so, which I found out by recent articles that had been published online, so I specifically chose this scenario to, make, to match real world um, to, to match a real-world scenario. And um, the URL in this email, I uh, linked to a website that I had cloned from their real healthcare benefits portal, but with some minor details changed. And once logged in, uh, we decided to leave the user at a blank page because our job for phase one was done. We had the, uh, the, we had the user's credentials. <clears throat> and as expected, after a day or so, people started becoming a little confused about why they couldn't log in and replied to the spoofed email that I had sent asking what was wrong. At this stage, we had access to uh, several users' email accounts so we could monitor what was going in, on in real time. Um, one user said, in particular, in Comic Sans, I followed the instructions and, what not, and was not able to log in. Please advise. And soon after, the real benefits team realized that they did not send this email and promptly replied with, this is not a legitimate email from the benefits department. Do not do anything. And at this stage, I was starting to think, well, this might be it. This might be the end of the engagement. But... One day later, when I still had access to all these users' email accounts, a company-wide email was sent titled, Hackers Gonna Hack, or at least try to. And I thought this was a little bit funny because I was reading this email from an employee's email account I had access to. At this stage, even though they identified that um, this email was a threat, they did not do anything about it. They did not block the email, they did not reset users' passwords, and I still had access to their email accounts. Um, and in that email, they attached a screenshot of my phishing email and asked everyone not to click or to respond to it. And following that, they signed with their security department email, infosecoperations at blah.com. And ended the email with, warm regards, Gwen. And at this stage, I'm thinking, well, great, I can now execute part two of my attack. They hadn't blocked the website, nor, they, nor had they issued password resets. And now that I know that Gwen works in the InfoSec Operations Department, um, and I can now make phone calls on the, the department's on the department's behalf to all affected users. Essentially, now I am pretending to play the role of the good guy, Gwen. So along comes Gwen, which is me, and I say on the phone to an unsuspecting person, so I'm now making phone calls to the affected users that were targeted by my phishing email, and I say on the phone to them, Hey, I'm Gwen. To take precautions from the recent health benefits scam, could you please visit this website and download this security patch? But of course, the security patch was an executable Metasploit payload that gave me access to their personal machine. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, so now that we have access to an employee's machine, and thanks to the social engineering and uh, we now have access to multiple employees' machines um, through remote desktop. In this part of the engagement, it was now up to us to find every nook and cranny in their network, which included their web, uh, web application, services, net network shares, and more. The first thing that called our attention before we even ran any network scans on the company was the presence of a web view WebSphere MQ client on a network share. <clears throat> For those who don't know, WebSphere MQ is just a queue manager often bundled with IBM's web application server called WebSphere, and it's um, primarily used to send messages across multiple platforms, something that we really shouldn't have access to as a low-level staff member. Once opened, we're presented with a bundle of saved servers, mostly on this corporation's UAT testing environment. 
One of the features that WebCMU uh, servers have is the ability to run scheduled services. And these services let you call arbitrary binaries on the server, being able to provide a single starting argument. Surprisingly, even with the ability to call, to call arbitrary binaries, we ran into a slight complication. Um, in that it had very strict, it had a, a very strict restriction where no shell ca control characters could be used in the commands you asked it to execute. So this included um, semicolons, pipes, angle brackets, etc. Our solution around this problem was to run a modified Python reverse shell without any control characters in their blacklist. In this case, where all semicolons were replaced with new lines. Alternatively, on Windows, we could have just used a file in the SMB network share to get RCE via WebCMQ instead of the complex single line Python command, but Python is always more fun. Okay, at this point, we're able to get a reverse shell on each of the WebCMQ servers, and uh, we found four unique MQ servers, and we're able to own them all. So we've now multiplied the numbers of machines compromised from one to four, sorry, compromised by four. When we took a quick look at some of the freshly compromised WebSvmQ servers, we found a Maven repository, we, we, sorry, we found Maven reposi repository configurations. I'm not doing good at talking today. Maven repository configuration files, there we go. And in these files, uh, an internal server is referenced, 10.1.109.9, which is not a real IP address, by the way. And using the WebSvmQ server as a proxy, uh, we then visit the Maven repo manager to find a trove of confidential company source code accessible without any authentication here for us to steal. So we can has the network. Um, and considering that the Maven repository was the 10.1.109.0 subnet, we run an Nmap scan to see if there's any other applications that we can access. And after the Nmap scan was finished, we had realized that not only did we have access to a large number of source code repositories through the through applications such as FishEye Fish and Nexus Sonotype, but we also had access to a machine, um, to, sorry, had access to three Jenkins servers that were pushing code to a large number of production systems. And to make it worse, no authentication was required for any of the Jenkins instances that we encountered. And to conclude this story, uh, let's look at a quick recap of the entire attack scenario presented here. So if we went from having access, I have a laser pointer, from one employee machine, um, so from zero access to remote command execution on production assets in just a few days. That GIF is supposed to play, but it's not playing. There we go. It's a bit late now, but. <laughs> this is my favorite episode. <laughs> okay, you get the point. <laughs> so the company has now lost a majority of, of its source code to an attacker. They have production assets that are just waiting to be owned, and all of this activity is sprouted by gaining access to a single employee machine by using social engineering. Okay, enough about what went wrong, um, and enough about the story, and now to talk about what went wrong. In this case, um, we assumed trust. In, um, in this story, trust was assumed with all the affected users to report that uh, if they had been targeted by the email. And trust was also assumed for the users not to visit the website after the email was sent. This is absolutely not the right way to go about it. After the engagement was over, several users kept trying to log in, and there was even one user in particular, which happened to be the CFO of the company, that tried to log in over and over again with different sets of credentials. This shouldn't happen after a threat is identified. Additionally, um, we're only protecting the outer barriers while not paying enough attention to the inside. There was no proper network segregation between the production and dev environment, we need to start thinking as if our environment is already compromised and go from there. 
So don't assume trust. Humans are bad at trust. We're bad at trust. The site should have been blocked as soon as it was identified, and password resets should have been issued to everyone who received the email. I had continuous access to all affected e uh, target emails, meaning I was able to still monitor everything that was happening in real time. This also gives me a lot of information to craft, to craft future attacks with the company. Um, so this means that we need to start protecting the outer and inner barriers, like I just said, while making sure we take a proactive approach to security and ensure barriers are secured before something goes wrong, not a reactive approach when it's already too late. So with another recent engagement, I was, uh, this one was a little different in that, again, um, this time I was posing as an internal employer for a big company. The person I picked sorry, an internal employee for a company. The person I picked had also been named Christina, um, which I picked because I thought it was funny. It was a very large company with thousands of employees, so I picked someone with the same name as me. Um, so the Christina that I had made up to pretend the real Christina was a gorgeous lady that was not good at computers. I mean, she was terrible at computers. She was really ditzy, didn't have it together, and of course, Christina had forgotten her password. So on the phone to an internal employee helpline assistant, and his job was to help employees, internal employees of this company to walk them through doing password resets or any technical problems they might be facing with their laptop. And on the phone I said, hey, I'm Christina. Um, I forgot my password and I don't have my laptop because I'm traveling right now and I really, really need access to my account to access a document. Can you please help, please? And, of course, the person over the phone said, yeah, sure, it's my job to help you, Christina. And he sent me to the website, their self-serve password reset website, um, to reset my password. However, I was pretending to have so many problems with accessing the website and figuring out how to do this myself that he said to me, word for word, okay, Christina, listen to me carefully. You got to go to that bar at the top of your browser. You see that thing where you type words into? Go there and type in the following. H, T, T, P, S. Don't forget the S, Christina, because S is for secure. Colon, forward slash, forward slash, W, 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 dot. And he proceeded to read out the entire URL to me like I was a four-year-old, which is exactly what I wanted. Eventually, we got to the password reset form, except we ran into a couple problems. Problem one was that I didn't have access to Christina's email to get the password, so even though if we happened to got the password reset, I couldn't have seen that password because I didn't have access to Christina's email. The solution was I was pretending to have so many issues with the reset form that he eventually just did it for me and read the password to me over the phone. But we ran into a second problem, and this one was tricky. They were using a good technical, technical defense in that they were, they were um, using 2FA tokens, so even though I could log into her account, I couldn't get past the 2FA prompt. Um, and they were using a 2FA token application installed on users' phones. Um, but I got around this by saying I accidentally erased my iPhone while I was on holidays. And the solution to that was he said, that's okay, Christina, let me see what I can do. And after a big back and forth, I miraculously had a four-day hard 2FA token to use and abuse, which completely defeated the reason, uh, which completely defeated the purpose of having a 2FA token in the first place. Um, meaning that this help desk customer support agent was able to bypass hard technical, hard technical controls that were put in place and was able to bypass it to the point of giving me a hard token. So now with my newfound password, my newfound 2FA token, I had access to their VPN, which meant I had access to their Citrix RDP application, which meant I had access to the internal network. Okay, so from there, um, taking over from the level of access we were able to gain from social engineering this particular corporation was a little bit trickier than the one I had presented about before. Um, so once we were on their internal network, we weren't able to find many internal hosts or applications by s simply scanning their um, internal IP ranges with a tool like Nmap before. 
I found this a bit odd and decided to revamp our um, recon game to see if internal applications were being hosted elsewhere for this application. It turns out that this big corporation decided to host all of their internal and development boxes in the cloud where access was limited to only those who were whitelisted um, IP address wise. So naturally, now that we had over 1,000 potential hosts to scour through, I went through most of them and picked the low hanging fruit. Um, so to do this, we used a combination of, sorry, DNS scanners. We used subroot, which is a, like a multi-threaded subdomain brute forces that utilizes open DNS resolvers. DNS dumpster uses um, data from scans.io and internet scans to find subdomains passively. Census IO scans the internet very often, about once a week or so, to, and catalogs all SSL certificates and other important metadata, usually including subdomains, which is also passive, and scans.io, which dumps out raw active scans of the internet, which is also hosted by census. So using all these four tools, we got an incredibly large list of domains. And even after years of pen testing, I'm still pleasantly surprised when I see stuff like this. I remember seeing Tomcat boxes with default creds when I was 13, and it's now 2016, and this shit's still here. <laughs> Through Tomcat boxes alone, I was able to gain, gain shell on 12 boxes throughout this corporation's network by simply compiling a reverse shell in a war format through um, Metasploit or similar, then uploading it through the panel. Um, and rinse and repeat 12 times. From there, it didn't take long for us to locate their core development boxes. And these development boxes were gold mines. All three core development boxes that we were able to access had the same default username and password. And after a bit of searching with the, within the Drupal administration panel, um, I realized that the devil.module was enabled, meaning out of the box arbitrary PHP execution, um, because it provides a large text area for entering PHP code into, so it's just there for us. Um, but surprisingly, this big corporation was copying direct backups of the production environment and using them on their development environments. This included all the data, all the data within their databases as well. And as per the dates I obtained, it seemed like a weekly or bi-weekly process that they, were coughing, that, that they were copying prod to dev. And at this point, we had found a total of three Drupal administration panels. And we could then take those credentials and log into their MySQL server to get production database data, which had uh, each database had their own Twitter account. Some had to, some had up to 200,000 followers, and every database we found contained active user data. On their shares, we also found plain text documents filled with passwords and various other environments, as well of, as well as unprotected NDA documents just floating around for every user in this company to see. Okay, what went wrong this time? Um, in this case, it really only took one person. The, the person over the phone that was trying to help me reset my password should not have had access to bypass hard technical controls that were put in place for a reason. He was a low-level customer support agent that was able to bypass a 2FA mechanism that was put in place for exactly this reason. And to reiterate, um, this was not a fancy or complicated attack. It came down to the simple reason that we do not enforce the same level of security on humans compared to the systems they, that they control. Um, so to sum up this talk, just as there are security roles in systems, the same role system should apply to humans. Am I running a little early? That's okay. If a person doesn't absolutely need to have access to a share or piece of information, do not grant it. All this achieves is creating a larger surface area for future attacks. Um, so yes, we need to conform to a permissions model for all assets information on a need to know basis. If someone does not need to have access to a piece of information, do not grant it to them. And to sum this all up, um, assume humans will make mistakes. Be paranoid, assume your environment is already owned 
do not reply, uh, rely on users to report if they've been owned or if they've done something wrong. Um, six simple steps I like to go through uh, that will reduce some of these attacks happening is implement anti-spoofing, SPFD can demark you there for a reason. Sandbox your browser and email client, so even if a user does something wrong or downloads an executable or downloads something malicious, at least those environments are sandboxed. Use browser plugins such as NoScript or there's a bunch more that I can't think of right now to um, reduce the risk of a user doing something wrong. Um, one thing I've seen some clients do, which is really interesting, is they alert on similar phishing domains. So when I typically start up a social engineering campaign, I will register domains that look visually similar to whoever the target company I'm targeting is. Um, and a lot of, com sorry, so some companies these days are alerting on any similar domain name registrations using something like URL crazy and then going through all of those similar domain, name, domain names. Um, so alerting on those could be handy. Five is uh, whitelist your applications and specific IPs as well. And six, use a VPN, but I think everyone does that these days. And before we end this talk, I found this amazing video from probably before we were, before I was born that sums up this talk pretty perfectly. <laughs> All right, got it. You might as well give me the keys to the front door. I'm going to get into your system. I'm going to get my hands on your data. I'll probably have more access to more areas of your computer network than most employees. And trust me, I'm going to take advantage of it. Someone got my password and used it to break into the network. I mean, he, he even had a toolbox. I didn't think anything of it when I saw that guy digging through the dumpster. So I gave her the information she needed. How was I supposed to know she was a hacker? Sometimes, when I'm targeting a company, I'm looking for something very specific. And at other times, it's a, a fishing expedition. I never know what I'm going to hook. Usually when you think hackers, you think computers and the data stored in those computers. But hackers also try to get their hands on data kept on paper or in our heads. Most of you make it pretty easy. Do you know that it took me less than a minute to install it on the guy's computer? Love, money, sex, uh, curse words. Hacking is easy. It's really no challenge at all to break in when you use names for passwords, and I'm into your system. Heck, I've even seen people who leave the password section blank. <laughs> like uh, repeating one letter or five letters in a row on the keyboard. <laughs> Why don't you just, just go ahead and go in, okay, and have one of the computer guys vouch for you. That's great. Thanks a lot. It's nice to have somebody helping make my job easy. Don't do this. Computer Services, Bob speaking. Yeah, hi, Bob. This is David Michaels from Marketing. Operations, this is Barbara. Yeah, hi, Barbara. This is Bob Kendall from Network Services. I know this sounds silly. My password was password. Okay, um, computer and password. All right, you are set. Great, thanks. thanks a lot. You have a good one. Oh, my God. That was so easy. <sighs> thanks. From me and the kids. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> What just happened? Bob's thinking it's nice to do a good deed. Elaine the hacker is thinking, gotcha. You'd be amazed at how quickly a password gets passed around. Once it leaves the safety of your memory, there's no telling where it might end up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Questions? Oh, come on. Yes. You think any of this stuff will ever get fixed? No. Next. <laughs> no questions. None at all. OK, if anyone decides they have questions, I'll be around all day and all night and tomorrow. Thank you.